for joining me on stage. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'm looking forward to our conversation very much. We've only got half an hour. It's right. nowhere near long enough, is it, to cover the things we're going to talk about. But I'll say also thank you to Michael Meff for inviting me along. I'm quite well-known troublemaker in this industry. And we're going to cause some trouble, I think, in this conversation because we're going to talk about real problems, but hopefully some solutions too today. But I prepared quite a, quite a long-winded opening question, so forgive me. <laughs> but it's going to be like setting the scene, so I'm keen to hear all of your answers to this opening question. I'm not a number. I am a free man. So was said by the character of number six, played by Patrick McGowan, in the classic cult TV series, The Prisoner, in the 1960s. A show he also wrote and created. Now, number six stubbornly refused to comply with the demands of a society called The Village. And life in The Village was peaceful and materially prosperous. But the only goal seemed to be to collect information, whether by surveillance or trickery or coercion. It could be argued the prisoner was ahead of its time in terms of predicting the future. My first question to everybody on this panel, perhaps you'd like to go first, Ellie. To what extent has the human race realized its goal of a global village? And that's because we're now equating every person's identity with, as Bradley pointed out, our mobile phone number. Uh, thank you, Eric, um, and uh, appreciate the opening question. Um, unfortunately, for those of us who were not born in the 1960s, right, then we don't have a good knowledge of the prisoner. Um, maybe some of us in the audience might know about Succession, perhaps a slightly more up-to-date TV series. Um, but in essence, the, um, the, the basic statement is uh, that the phone number has become the identity. Right? That's essentially the most ubiquitous identity that exists on the planet today. Right? The global E164, that standard set up so many years ago, decades and decades ago, with all the kind of structure that goes with it behind the regulators, behind the allocation of numbers, and, and ultimately, it is the one number and the one identity that sticks with you almost throughout your entire life. Um, so in that sense, yes, I think we have achieved a global common identity. Um, and it's something that is being used, as we heard from the presentations before, is being used more and more as part of the identity of your life, whether from an e-commerce perspective, whether from a uh, validation perspective, or whether from a risk assessment perspective. But the plus side of that means that we have to recognize the minor side of that, right? We are here in London today, um, not seven months ago, was the largest UK fraud um, uh, activity that took place, uh, a company called uh, iSpoof, that led to 100 arrests, um, uh, the biggest takedown um, ever in UK fraud history, all about spoofing of the CLI. So the fact that our identity is now based upon our phone number means an incredible sensitivity and pressure is being put on the trust that we can allocate towards the CLI. Um, and I'm sure we will discuss that in the panel. Sorry? Yes, so um, I'd like to take the number from the other side, and that's uh, of businesses. And in the US, uh, a number of years ago, there was uh, a company called uh, Grand Central, uh, which uh, came up with the idea that a phone number is not connected to a physical location, but it's connected to a, a business, or it can be. And uh, they worked with a company called Net Number, which was on the, the stage earlier today. Uh, and they came up with a, an ability to reroute or SMS enable uh, phone numbers. And that became uh, Google Voice. And it started this big 10 DLC uh, activity in the United States. And what happened is over time, a lot of really great services came from those numbers. Uh, you can think about Uber and Airbnb and all these different ways of engaging. Um, and it got to the point where it got a little bit out of control because nobody really knew who was behind these numbers. And so um, what we're finding is that if you have that number and you can track that number and know who has it when and connect that with actual verified information, that's a powerful tool for enabling uh, you know, proper wanted communication and limiting unwanted communication. So what we're seeing is, yes, you can have this horrific 
you know, uh, Orwellian world of everybody knows everything about you and they know about your number and all these type of things. But we're also seeing elements where it can uh, be used uh, as an exchange of transparency for, of, of the message sender for reliability and predictability about how their messaging will be treated as a means of, of growing a healthy ecosystem. So but maybe there's a, a positive spin on that. But there's an irony there, isn't there? Because we know everything about everybody, but then if someone assumes your number, then suddenly they've got your identity now. Isn't that the, isn't that the essence of the problem here? It's all on the number. And as soon as somebody else can assume, replicate, impersonate your number, it's impossible to tell one from the other, for as far as the ordinary person who's receiving the messages or the calls. That is a problem. And so that's why it's really important to figure out tools to authenticate and create more uh, trust and reliability and understanding of what's happening. And, you know, the, uh, it's, it's interesting. You know, back in the day, the, the phone number, I knew it as, you know, my kitchen phone or my desk phone. Now it's anywhere, anything can be anybody, especially with AI. So you do need tools, and we do need to figure out how we can work through this and you know, make it better step by step. John, come on, bring, come in here and help me out here. <laughs> Is there a way we can broaden it out so it's not just the number anymore? What do we do when we verify the identity of somebody or, or a legal entity, a company? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I'm kind of taking the same point of view, which is for each of us individually, yes, our phone number is our identity. But what we're talking about is individuals dealing with businesses. And businesses, the phone number is not their identity. The LEI is their identity, for example, or other you know, uh, IDs that are generated, your tax ID. Um, those are the things that identify a company. And so what we really need to do with phone number uh, as an identity is be able to attach specific phone numbers to specifically identified businesses and have repositories that share that information so that you can engage trusted you know, phone numbers from a consumer to business perspective. Um, and honestly, the, the issue is, is that while we all have our phone numbers, our identity, there are just as many phone numbers in the world that are unassociated with anything you know, lease numbers and other types of ways that phone numbers are used, um, phone number is not the identity for the entire set of you know, uh, entities doing things. People and if you change entities. your number, then yeah. you can have information about the previous owner or the owner before that. Yeah. So I, it's kind of two sides of the coin to me. On the one side, great, you know, tying a phone number to a person, I understand that, but there is no database that is publicly available that actually does tie the phone number to the person. It's behavioral information, right? When was the last time it was ported? How many times is it? How, how long has it been in this single ownership? Right? Uh, that's great. Um, but from our perspective, while the phone number is critical, we need from a business side to identify, verify businesses, understand that business's behavior depending on the channels they're going to operate, and tie phone numbers to that business so that when they are engaging consumers, you know whether or not you can trust that phone number. Okay, let's stay with you, John, on this one then. So I, I'm still confused on this issue. I'm really keen to hear everyone's point of view and also the audience too on this. So please chip in. Authenticating a legal person, a corporate entity, versus authenticating a human being. They are distinct challenges. Which is the more complicated challenge? Which will be solved first and why? John. Oh That's a very interesting question. Um, so, you know, authenticating individuals, obviously, you've got a lot of regulations that also restrict that. Uh, in terms of the businesses in telecom that are being authenticated, for the last dozen plus years, we've been authenticating businesses. Um, it's really a right to participate in a channel that says you as a business will share your identity information. And if, you know, GDPR, you want that removed from the database, great, you're out of the channel, right? Um, so it's not a regulatory issue um, necessarily, but the other challenges that we're facing is how do you create low friction, high volume, low cost, uh, but you know, absolute assurance of identity and behavioral history. Um, and interestingly, businesses can be very, very complex. They're not people. Um, they're a group of people, mm -hmm. right? And so behaviorally, um, you're not just looking at the long history of the business, you're also wondering oh, who's coming and going in that business. 
who's now in charge, who's acquired, what's the relationship in terms of uh, ownership structure, right? Uh, all your OFAC and other you know, international sanctions watch lists, all that stuff that's not readily apparent when you're looking at a business makes business verification, in my opinion, very dynamic on an ongoing basis. And so identity on today of a business and their behavioral assessment as to whether or not you're gonna let them come into your uh, channel changes tomorrow. They could be a completely different company tomorrow. Whereas people generally, I believe, are a little more consistent. You know, once, once a, a scammer, always a scammer. Um, now there is Breaking Bad, which we've all seen the show, uh, but you know, business is a little more dynamic in my opinion. Do you agree, Sarah? So uh, from the, the individual standpoint, the, there's a number of challenges. One challenge is the regulatory issues that we talked about. There's also a lot of technical challenges too. So in the areas that I've seen at work, it's typically when there's one party that can act as a gateway for that, that marketplace. And in that case, you can put together a do not call list and you can do sorts of things and it's consolidated uh, amongst one or very few parties and it's controllable. Once you start getting into ecosystems with a lot of different gateways and a lot of different providers and a lot of different folks, everybody has their own definitions, their own ways of doing things. Their, our way is better than their way and it just becomes a very difficult thing to implement. Uh, and if you want to start going into the uh, example of government ID check and real-time validation and these type of things, then that includes cost as well. So I think on that side, those things will make it more difficult, but it, it, it doesn't stop it from happening if you have a more controlled uh, ecosystem, and in some places that's the case, or into specific market areas. So specific segments uh, where you can implement it. On the business side, uh, you know, I, I'm a big believer in trying to build healthy ecosystems. And, and a healthy ecosystem means that there's an incentive to comply, an incentive to, to actually go through the extra steps. And these extra steps aren't annoying. They, they can create more friction. They can be difficult. There can be complaints and people will say, I don't want to do this. I want to be able to do everything the way I want. And uh, so you have to give some sort of incentive to that process. And so we're big believers in trying to create a solution where the, the message sender has a reason for doing some type of registration, reducing the, the friction and creating, creating value. So we exchange transparency for reliability. In a lot of markets where you don't have this place, people just randomly shut down messages and block things and it makes a very poor experience and a very unreliable situation for message senders. So if you can create a, a situation where good traffic is rewarded with good predictable uh, uh, network behavior, then that's sort of a win-win environment. Um, so the good news is, is that uh, the challenge which you're highlighting is really something that the entire industry, and I'm stressing here both on the voice side and on the messaging side, is cognizant is something that does need to be addressed. Um, the basic trust in identity, and especially when it comes down to phone number as your identity, is something that is under pressure and under challenge. But the good news is through efforts both of the MEF, um, working groups that are now focused exclusively on provided trust and messaging, and part of that will all be to drive that concept of relying on that the sender ID that is being presented, or the alphanumeric, or on the phone number side and the voice world that when a call comes into you and it comes up with a brand saying, this is a call from Barclays Bank and here's the Barclays Bank logo and here's the reason go for that. These provide the foundations of identity and this is a core effort that both the I3 Forum, which is a, uh, a global association, I'm a board member there and it's been one of the hottest topics. We launched a major new initiative just a few weeks ago at ITW in, uh, in Washington. So, so these are both these areas of identity and of providing that foundation of trust in identity is something that the industry collectively is working on. And if we don't work on it as an industry, and this is a statement again, both on the messaging side and on the voice side, if we look at what's happening at the NRAs, the national regulatory authorities, 
more and more activity in the past few months, even in the past few weeks, which is highlighting that NRAs are beginning to get involved and are driving their view of how we're going to force the industry into making these changes. And this is an opportunity once, almost once in a generation time of we need to lead or we will be led. Right? And it's a kind of call and a clarion call to make sure that as an industry, both on the messaging side and the voice side, with a holy grail to merge these two together, it's both messaging side. As a Barclays Bank, I want to be able to engage with my customer. Here's my trust identity on my message. Here's my trust identity on a voice call. In both of these, these are the foundations. We as an industry need to take this opportunity now to lead, and otherwise we're going to be led. Omni identity. Yeah. <laughs> I commend you for offering leadership. We certainly need it. So let's get on with it as quickly as possible. And you touched upon registries there, and someone also mentioned do not originate. So my next question will start with you, So Do not originate lists, I would say, are a brilliant and very successful way of reducing crime by obstructing the most common forms of impersonation. And being born in Yorkshire, Yorkshiremen are notoriously mean. So I also like it because it's a cheap way of reducing crime. And registries, forgive me too, they also seem to be a cost-effective way of tackling a real-world problem. Not least because they stop impersonation fraud in a simple, no-nonsense manner. Should more effort be put into registry-style solutions to address impersonation fraud. Could the same principles be more broadly applied to other forms of communication services like voice calls too? I'm thinking here about the potential to use maybe rich cold data for voice calls. So I'll start with you, Soren. Yeah, so um, we've, we've implemented a solution in the United States where we exchange uh, 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 transparency for reliability. So in the last roughly year and a half, and we've got partners in the, the room uh, here that, that help us with this. Um, we've enabled an ecosystem where uh, we have uh, have roughly 1,000 plus uh, uh, service providers, message service providers that use the solution. And they have registered uh, over a million brands and created over a million campaigns. And so what does this mean? So. Uh, what this means is that uh, to, to use this channel, as uh, John had talked about, you have a, a verified business that would be verified by Aegis or other uh, agreed partners. You'd have a telephone number and you'd have a campaign ID all connected in and then locked into the ecosystem. So what does that mean? That means that the five billion messages a month that pass uh, through 10 DLC and are delivered to end consumers, every single registered message from there, the ecosystem can pull it up and they can say, this is the verified uh, brand and sending messaging sender that was behind this. These are all the connection points. This is the service that they claim to be doing and these are data points around this service. And then that can be compared with actual behaviors. And that creates a, a very powerful mechanism to really go after and support uh, wanted messages and uh, reduce unwanted messages. And this is for, uh, if you have one phone number, you can pull up the campaign and you can see all the numbers associated with that campaign. Also connected to this, there's a ecosystem of communication. So the carrier might have a, a fraud report that comes up from their, uh, providers or from complaints from the, the iPhone or, or Android devices, they can look into something and they can immediately flag and communicate straight down to the exact campaign and to the exact parties involved with sending that. So that really creates a lot of value to uh, clean up the, the marketplace. And for companies that do good messaging, it's, it's, they, they actually do enjoy that service. We're at the very beginning of this. so. Everything gets built on top of this, but this is a very good beginning for basically a year and a half of service. Ellie, you look like you want to jump in. Um, so the, uh, I agree, Eric, your introduction on this question is a, actually a really set of pertinent points. This concept of do not originate, and perhaps it's just worth spending 30 seconds on explaining what this list is. 
Um, so a number of countries have now launched this initiative, um, Do Not Originate. Uh, our parent company, a company called Somos, um, which provides services to a thousand plus operators in the States. They are the trusted neutral entity that provides um, the widest comprehensive list of Do Not Originate. The concept behind Do Not Originate is, is almost as simple as follows. Um, again, I'm going to use the example of Barclays Bank. Advertising in social media, all over the, all over the uh, TV, is here's our phone number, contact us for all your customer issues or, or you want to sign up to our services. So that phone number is kind of identified in the world out there as this is Barclays' phone number. So the bad side is that from a spoofer's perspective, this is an ideal scenario of I take that number, I spoof that number, and that's exactly what was happening with the iSpoof um, fraud event in the end of last year in the UK, takes that number, phones up, in inverted commas, poor old granny, and seconds later, £20,000 is coming out of her account to wherever and, what, and, and whoever. Um, so that's the basic flaw in having a common phone number that is identified at a business level. So the do not originate is a really smooth, low-cost, value-add service that immediately brings a structure whereby Barclays Bank turn around and say, that number is marked as do not originate, and therefore if any of you telecoms companies ever see a phone call originating with that number, block it. So that's actually come into legislation, that's actually come into regulation. Um, so the USA implemented do not originate. Uh, the actual date of it kicked in practice was at the end of last year on the voice side. And what's most interesting is that the uh, FCC, just in the last few months-ish, um, has just announced that they will likewise be applying the concept of do not originate lists likewise on the, um, on the text side as well. The concept is nice and easy. The UK government um, followed suit. Uh, there's, a, there's a spreadsheet, actually, which we, a table which we identified across all NRAs in about 15, 16 countries as they are developing their own do not originate list. So the, the plus side is, is actually it's a, it's a very simple way. It doesn't cost the industry huge amounts of money. It's a way that can dramatically impact on spoofing and, and ultimately and, and spamming and, and scams. And it's something that certainly as from an XNet perspective, something that we really believe the industry can adopt and can help address as one of the elements in addressing this solution. John, is this something where we need to see more of, in general, collective data to help to verify who's a good and a bad actor in the ecosystem? Yeah, interesting. Collective would be a different term than, um, uh, you know, uh, diversified but centrally accessible data sources, if you will, right? Because we're all talking about blockchain and other technologies where you have a bunch of players, but how do you access it all at once, right? And Noah will talk about that too, I'm sure. but. Um, I was going to touch on, so the do not call list, uh, or do not uh, terminate list, do not originate list, uh, some of the stuff that Soren talked about, you know, phone number data is one component to Aegis of verifying uh, and putting a risk score on businesses to do messaging or calling. And Aegis is involved in uh, branded calling, which you brought up, also RCS and, you know, branded chatbots and branded messaging and all that good stuff. Um, and so, you know, phone number is one of the things that you're looking at that's owned by a company that wants to register. Their URL, you know, the domains that they own are very relevant to be looking at. Uh, so it's not just who they are, their legal background, who owns them, but it's also looking at things like phone number and, uh, and owned domains and what is the historical behavior of those uh, in putting a risk score on a company. Um, so accessibility to that type of information and the ability to tie it to a business uh, becomes very critical. And then one of the other things I was going to say is, you know, Soren talked about it. Um, for this 10 DLC market, we're approaching 1.3 million brands that we have done an identity or vetting verification on, a background check on uh, over the last 15 months. And, um, you know, the trick to doing that is really going after a lot of different types of information you know, to try and assess the behavior of these companies. But the other trick is getting the feedback because the reality is, is that there are, you know, bad messages going out on 10DLC, even though we are, but you know, it's not a lot. But when they do, we can focus in on them immediately 
um, and we are notified, we have hundreds of data fields that describe that business, but we also know every related business that's re registered, and all that data goes into the bad guy database, right? So you can prevent whack-a-mole, you can prevent these companies from coming back as new entities, and we've been doing this for more than a dozen years, because you have so much information on them that they're gonna have to completely recreate themselves to, to come back and pass you know, through our analysis. Um, so it's not just the upfront part, as I was saying, it's about collecting the information of what's actually behaviorally happening in market over time, and then sharing that information across all the channels. We've got so many great products in this room and in the industry that today are not necessarily integrated in communication and feedback. You know, today, at least in 10 DLC, we get information about consumer complaints, right? So we can actually take that, work with our partners, and you know, shut it down and prevent them from coming back. But uh, broader, we need to get there. Very keen insight, thank you. I, I'm gonna catch you all a little bit by surprise by asking a question I didn't prepare, but I think it's really relevant from what you've been saying and also what Andrew said earlier on. He, he used the word that I liked very much, retribution. And you've mentioned the ice spoof uh, prisoner now, convicted ice spoofer, 14 years in prison. He was given in Southwark Crown Court on Thursday of last week. We don't have stir shaken in the UK, but we put a spoof away in prison for 14 years. And, and I, I, feel, I feel some sorrow for our American cousins because you're always giving out hundreds of millions of dollars of fines for people doing spoofing, never seems to be collected, no one ever seems to end up in prison. So my question, a quick question as I'm conscious of time for everyone in the panel, is the value of the work you're seeking to do, would it be enhanced if there was more retribution for bad actors to back up your work, at least starting with you? Um, I think, and it's an interesting statement because the industry typically, both on the game of stressing voice and messaging, has usually tried to avoid um, having any direct kind of engagement with regulatory and the government in the sense of leave us alone, let us do what we can do as best as we can. Um, however, there are certain cases here when examples of exactly that, right, that statement of somebody being thrown away for, in inverted commas, for 14 years in prison, right, for, for developing the ice booth, is actually beneficial to us as an industry, right, far more than uncollected $100 million fines. So in that sense, have, working carefully in a kind of self or even joint regulatory methodology by engaging with the NRAs and with the government and saying, listen, we as an industry recognize we need to improve this situation. Um, we're going to do it as best as we can. We need your support. And the support that the government and the NRAs can do is to help inf in in inflict the pain, right? Provide that kind of um, retribution in inverted commas that actually provides the, the balance to make this happen. So, so I do believe it's a kind of combined effort of, of industry, of the key industry bodies, together with the NRAs, together with the government, to actually jointly, we can address this. So, and would it enhance your proposition in terms of giving people more incentive to get on the registry, and then conversely identify who's a bad behavior in the ecosystem? It's kind of a carrot and stick uh, type of thing. So the, the regulatory groups and the, the legal groups can provide a, a really good stick element and you know, I would leave it up to them, and if, if we can provide tools to help them identify and, and determine how they want to do that, that's, that's fine. I, you know, my focus is really on, on building a healthy ecosystem and really providing support for growth for the people that are actually trying to do the right things, and as quickly as possible, enabling weeding out the, the bad actors. So, you know, we can, we can build on these do not originate lists. We can build on these things if you know who is actually sending things and if it's really difficult to bounce around and hide in the shadows. So the more that we can create a foundation, then you can really start creating a, a, a lot of situations where you, you build a carrot to in, enable proper communication because I do believe that... A, a, for, for businesses that want to grow, a healthy messaging ecosystem just makes sense for everybody. I mean, if you, know, if you feel comfortable when you get a message in that this is really from who it should be from, it, that becomes a very personal, very direct, very fast means for growing business and growing commerce. It makes sense. And these small groups of folks that just spam and create all this chaos, it hurts 
the overall uh, environment. I think most of, it hurts most of the players out there. So it's it you know we're focused on the the carrot side, and if if stick comes in, that um, you know that's fine too. John, that's interesting. So. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I actually believe with premium SMS, somebody did go to jail in yes, the U.S. They did. Um, well, they, I don't know if they went to jail in the U.S., but they they, go, they were in Australia. But they, okay. I don't know which jail they ended up in, but yeah, yeah, yeah. a few of them did. Uh, yes, but for doing bad things. Yes. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, you know, I, I would kind of reiterate what uh, Soren was saying in that. Um, Regulation is very important to provide incentive to implement compliance solutions. The reality is that it's a very small fraction of the actors that are bad in any of the telecom channels that we've operated in, which is many, but they can have a major impact on an entire channel. I mean, premium SMS was about $3 billion at its peak, I think, in the U.S. market. And the entire thing went down because of a single percentage fraction of bad actors. Um, the, uh, but the other, tr like I said, so at the end of the day, um, those bad actors are actually driving a lot of what we're doing to create the trusted market. But with brick and mortar going away and the digital world emerging, I think you know, compliance activities are going to be critical to create trust in these new markets. So. Um. Just to make sure we finish off on a positive note. Yeah. So we've been highlighting a lot of the kind of the, the sticks, right? And, and I think yeah. Soren used the words of, you know, the, we can look at both the carrot as well as the stick. And I think it's really important that we recognize the opportunity on the carrot side because yeah. speak of all doom and gloom kind of is a bit negative so early in the morning. Yeah. Um, this so, is my personality, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, so, so let's highlight on the carrot side. Um, so we're currently involved right now working with a, a major... European MNO top three on the basic concept of delivering a trusted call. And the idea being that here you have the enterprise, again, let's use the example of Barclays Bank, who's communicating with their customer, and the customer wants to have the comfort that when they are receiving the call, and it is coming up as being marked as this is a branded call, Barclays Bank, and, and here's the logo, that this is actually something that is genuine and is not being spoofed. And that concept today is literally is happening as we speak. It's, you mentioned before about rich call data, branded calling, um, and, and these new initiatives are coming out there, both on the messaging side, through trust on the messaging side, and on the voice side. The good news is, is that this actually introduces an entire new service opportunity and a new revenue opportunity, because ultimately the enterprise will be happy to pay a premium for the delivery of this is a trusted call. Here's a green tick that verifies this is a trusted call. So identifying that new mode of delivering trusted communications is actually a positive benefit to the end user and actually a revenue opportunity for the entire ecosystem. So the, there's a plus and minus, there's a carrot and stick here. If we play our cards right, then we have a big rosy future ahead of us. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's why I suspect maybe the corporate problem will be solved first because there's a very clear incentive. Whereas when you try to have the entire population authenticated, it becomes a bit trickier. I'm oh, very conscious could, of time. Could, could I add one quick thing? So the verification of logos um, is a critical part of branded calling and branded messaging, obviously. And it introduces a lot of legal mm -hmm. potential issues. If you want to go at scale, to do Barclays, to do Fortune 500 companies is very straightforward. But when you open up to the whole world, you know, it becomes, mm -hmm. you can do it. It's, it's doable. But understand it opens up a whole new world of right. identity. Do we have time for questions from the floor? We've got time for a quick two questions. Yeah, uh, Chad Wallen, Privacy Experience Agency. It seems like there's a very clear, bounded definition of a bad actor that you're talking about in your head. I'm just wondering how things like the Digital Services Act and other legislation in the United States, which talks about dark patterns and anti-patterns where maybe more legitimate actors are deceiving and misleading users to hand over information that then might end up them seeing as spam. So, it, you know, just is there in, the, in life's Venn diagrams, are those two circles of good and bad actors collapsing when you add 
the notion of a dark pattern or an anti-pattern, which is being legislated for. I mean, the Digital Services Act comes in next year in Europe. And also, just finally, what do you think of Samsung's smart call? Great questions. Who wants to go? Um, so, in terms of the um, uh, the bad actors, uh, you know, a lot of that is uh, engaged with by the, the filtering companies and the carriers themselves. You know, we're we're out of the actual message uh, flow, uh, but what I do see there is is a, a challenge uh, of identifying what is the the white, black, gray of that that process. And I'll give you an example. In the very beginning of talking about this, this issue, um, I met with tier one carriers in the United States that had a problem that their own marketing messages to their own customers were getting blocked by their own firewalls as spam and fraud. Uh, so they were trying to, to send out a message of, hey, you can upgrade your, your phone now on XYZ carrier, blocked, uh, targeted as, as, as fraud. And so what, there is a, a very high level of sophistication of a good message versus a bad message and, and how close they appear to each other. So uh, as a part of that process, what we've tried to do is not only work with the ecosystem participants to determine what type of information to collect, which helps them differentiate between these good and bad, but also to provide that to the ecosystem participants so that they can look at complaints that come in, look at what the messaging was, and look at what was actually claimed that this, this group was, was going to be doing, and then determine if it was easy or difficult to, to identify that as a bad actor. If it is identified as phishing and spam and bad actor, then they can feed into databases, which then goes into the verification process. Or they could say, hey, this is a false positive. This is actually just a fine message. It's a little bit marketing-y in terms of how it's, it's constructed, but it's actually a legitimate message. So, you know, I, I think it's very difficult to really precisely say one way or the other how you do these things. It's, it's kind of a, a, um, an art more than a science. But what we're trying to do is provide more data and information so these tools become more effective in terms of identifying, at least in broad strokes, the, the good from the bad. Can I, I'll, I'll add one thing to that. So uh, Aegis does a lot of different compliance products. One of those that we are involved in is the collection of spam reports from OEMs for messaging. And so we get all the raw messages that are being forwarded you know, from your iPhone, for example, you know, that says this is spam reported as junk. And we're finding that a significant amount are not actually unwanted messages. It's a matter of training people to realize that when you say delete and report, you're effectively saying this is an, an unwanted message. And uh, so it's becoming, it's very interesting to see, you know, what's actually coming in from consumers uh, and how do you filter out what's not and then filter down to who you should need to go after to shut down. Well, I, I spoke with a tier one carrier in the United States about these reports yeah. and uh, of the top 20 uh, uh, entities behind the, the spam activity, a, a lot of them were, were very well-known companies that yeah. provide taxi types of services and food delivery types of services and you know, banking services, they, they were completely fine. But what also happens is when you are an operator and you receive a number of complaints, you have to check those complaints, but also check it against the volume of messages that went out. Yeah. If you have 50 million messages that go out and you've got three complaints, it's probably okay, right? If you have three messages that go out and you've got three complaints, then you, it's, it's a different situation. So uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. These tools just give you more information to work with and try to, to provide a clean, efficient ecosystem. I would, uh, I would add, I'm not sure exactly the particular Samsung service you're referring to, but in general, the opportunity of delivering, again, going back to the common theme of trusted communications. So when you want to be able to have a, ultimately a tick that comes onto the call or the message that says, this is a verified call, this is a verified message, so it's interesting, the actual underlying technology that can enable that to happen. And without spending a lot of time going through concepts of trusted trunk, which is 
being led by certain initiatives, uh, Cisco and EE over here, uh, the concept of stir shaken, which has been a, what's the word for it? A good experiment in the USA. Um, the the other opportunities of kind of out of band, but ultimately it's enabling that indicator with the brand and with that logo to be delivered. Now, the actual mechanics can be either that that's being done at device level, so hence a kind of device play, a Samsung play, an Apple play, et cetera, et cetera, or it's being done at the actual terminating network level, the mobile network operator itself doing that. And right now, today, there's different pluses and minuses of the benefits where that's done in the network. The, the, if it's done at the network level, then you have the benefit of doing it for all your 30 million subscribers. On the other hand, if it's being done at the device level, then it's obviously a function of does that device have the right SDK and the right app, et cetera. But the other plus side is that the app side can do nice things like logos and, and reason codes, et cetera, whilst the network level today can only do things like alphanumeric text saying this is a Barclays bank call with perhaps a little green tick option. So that, so that world is definitely evolving and we're seeing from our perspective the, the projects that we are engaged with today, we're seeing both network level uh, essentially delivery of trusted calls or device level and I think the world will emerge and evolve to both sides being an important part of that ecosystem. Uh, well, I knew that we would not be able to fit it into the time available, this conversation. I did say at the beginning. But we're going to be having a break, and these guys can be hanging around. So ask your questions during the break. Thank, give a big round of applause for John, Soren, and Faye. <laughs>